I like the rhythm section. If you guys come back next week and give me some of that before I preach, it might help me out a little bit. I like that. Today we have a special program for you. Um, Andrew has already introduced you to some of the additions to our praise team. Uh, last Sunday was a meeting at Tri-City Christian Academy. And at that meeting, our fellowship, the Triad Adventist Fellowship, was welcomed into the Sisterhood of Churches to be a constituent church of Tri-City Christian Academy. So what does that mean? That means we're going to give some money to Tri-City Christian Academy. But nobody eats for free here. So we immediately said, let's get the students over here and work for their money. <laughs> so we have invited Tri-City Christian Academy. We have some students, some teachers, some parents, some sponsors. They recently went on a mission trip to Latin America, to the Dominican Republic, right there on their shirts. And they're going to come today and present a little video to us, a little slideshow, and then give some testimonies about their experience. And uh, David St. Hilaire is here, and he is from the Dominican. So when he sees a picture of something he recognizes, he's just going to raise both hands and wave. So with that, I'd like to invite the team forward, and uh, we'll begin our special program today. We have a variety of microphones here you can use.
we arrived there, we unpacked and looked at our situation. And the beds were pretty much metal frames with thin mattresses. And you'd have to go get another mattress from a bed that no one was using and stack them on top of each other to feel pretty comfortable. The bathrooms, you couldn't flush any toilet paper down because otherwise they'd clog. And in fact, that's what happened to the boys' uh, first area that we were staying in, so we had to move. And uh, that was pretty much our first day in the Dominican Republic. I woke up on an early Friday morning, I had breakfast, we had worship, then everybody got up to go to their different destinations. I went to Brisa Sunday, which is a church a little ways from where the place we were staying. We did painting, we did trimming, and we did some construction. Okay, so this is the last Saturday that we were there. Um, I went to Brisa Stelly then because I painted a lot as well, and so I wanted to see my church finished because I didn't get to paint there every single day because we switched it up. But this is what the church looked like when it was done. I think it looks really well. Um, we all had we all fellowship together and we had worship in our brand new sanctuary. So that was it was really nice to see that. So the first day, we were supposed to be waking up earlier than uh, 7.30 because that's when breakfast started, but I woke up at 7.30 because that way the line would be down and uh, you could get whatever was left. Uh, then we went off to construction, and construction, as bad as it sounds, was not that hard. It was pretty much just drilling together some metal beams, and then we put those metal beams up, and that's where the roofing was going to go. I got to climb up on the scaffolding to put up the beams, but everyone else had to stay below and hand them up. It was pretty fun. Okay, so this is Vacation Bible School. Uh, we had a long, about an hour bus ride uh, to the school we were going to. Um, once we got there, we unpacked all of our stuff and got ready for the craft and the music we play. Um, once we did that, all the kids started to come in, and they all sat at their desks, and um, after that we started our craft, which was a little lion-type thing uh, that they would glue together, and these are just some of the kids uh, putting those together. Uh, also at the end, we made little bone animals and gave them away to the kids. It was cool to see, or it was cool to give them away because they were happy for um, just this little thing that we made for them. We packed up and we took the hour long bus ride home. Okay, so we, I had a great experience on the bus. It was um, better than any of the buses that we were um, had to drive. And then, so, so we got on this bus, we took a two hour drive. Then we arrived at the beach and we waited for a little um, small boat to take us to a nice pontoon boat. And then we um, waited. So originally what we were told was we would have a 20 minute boat ride to a sandbar and then we would swim in the sandbar and we told there would be starfish in there and stuff and then we would continue on the pontoon boat to the beach where we would be swimming and shopping and stuff like that. But it turns out that it was actually two over two hours worth of boat ride just and then with the sandbar stop in the in between there. And so that was it was Kind of annoying, but it was kind of fun at the same time because we all just hung out on the boat and that was really fun. Cool.
we arrived at the sandbar, and uh, while we were there, we jumped in the water, even though we weren't supposed to. <laughs> and, um, and the water was like clear, you could see straight to the bottom, and we, and we saw star, starfish the size of my face. And I have a pretty long face, so <laughs> <laughs> those are good. <laughs> we stayed there for about half an hour, and then we got back on our boat and continued our journey. So after our long boat ride, we finally got off the boat and um, we docked and went to this little section of the beach that they had reserved for their and that was really cool. Um, it was really nice scenery and it was like we were seeing a place called the Blue Real Life when we got off of the boat, so that was really cool to see. So after we've been there a while and we've been swimming and stuff, um, they called us all over and we went to this little hut and they fed us, they gave us food. It was kind of like a potluck thing where they had all the food laid out and we go through with your plate and get some. It was, the food was very good. It was like, there was rice and spaghetti. That's what I had it After we ate, we hit up the shops and uh, it was pretty much just a long strip of different shops with a lot of the same thing. There are a few differences here and there, like some had wristbands, some had necklaces, some had t-shirts, but uh, it was all pretty much the same thing. It, some stores had um, deals, for instance, 30% off from the whole store, and if you could go there and you find, found something you wanted, you could barter it down even lower. So say you started at $20, you might be able to get them down to $15 or even $10, depending on how you barter them. So also while I was there, I had the lucky opportunity to go do a little bit of snorkeling. Um, I was sitting, standing on the beach and I saw a couple people out really far in the distance over by this broken down um, boardwalk it used to be. And I saw them all swimming there and stuff and so I swam out there and I went and joined them and my mom was out there. I was like, hey mom, how are you doing? And we all were, we went snorkeling a little bit around the base of the So snorkeling turned out to be really, really fun. We were able to go right near the beach and we saw amazing fish. Uh, my favorite part was seeing a bunch of clear fish. There must have been thousands of them. And uh, it was a lot of fun to just swim in among them. And then there were all these things growing on the legs of the pier. We saw chitons and uh, all kinds of other marine interesting items. So it turned out to be great. Soon in. Let's remember the friend, special friends we made and the memories we made with them as well.
come and have a seat here. So if you went to the Dominican Republic, please come and have a seat. Spiritual aspect, he, he can come and dwell 
in our sanctuary. And that's what I thought of every day when I when I went there. And that made it more easier for me to work there too. Uh, at the construction site. Thank you. Thank you so much. Amy. Next, next slide, please. So I'm just going to give you a little bit about Maranatha and what they do and how they do it. Okay, so Maranatha's major goal is this, to build people by providing urgently needed buildings. To provide ordinary people, like Destin and all of us, an opportunity to make service a part of their lives. So yeah, it was great to go on one mission trip, but in my mind, we're already planning the next one. Some people, some of these young men are really excited about going on another one, and some of them are not so excited about going on another one. But as long as we, we serve and we get into a culture of service, then that's what we are looking for. So there's a picture of the Dominican Republic. We were right kind of in the middle, right where it says Santo Domingo. They call it a suburb. That's suspect, but we'll keep moving. Okay, so this trip was designed for small groups. Maranatha does several different trips, but this trip was for groups. We had groups of one all the way up to 17. So that your group may not have every single staff person that was necessary to make that thing happen, but you bring all these different groups together, we ended up to be about 90 strong, and um, we went. So that's our little, our little tri-city plus group. And our ages range from nine to, <clears throat> okay, go right ahead. <laughs> I think I was the <clears throat> so I'm, I'm good with that. <laughs> okay, so first thing we'll tell you a little bit about is camp life. Uh, Eliza, why is that picture important? Well, um, the reason why is because that's, um, that's Jordan, he's carrying water bottles and, no, not water bottles, water jugs, and we needed to uh, um, rep replenish our water bottles every day because of the tap water it had parasites and different other small things that we couldn't see that would harm us. So it was important for us to be um, replenished with water every day because we were, uh, it was hot. So we had to stay had hydrated all the time. Thank you. And that's the great thing about going with an organization like Maranatha. We didn't have to get there and worry about, oh no, where are we going to have clean water? When we showed up, they were there a couple of days before. They have people who live in the country. So the water jugs were there and ready to be and ready to be replenished. So this is the room that the guys talked about. Um, and uh, go to the next one. Lots of fun in the uh, camp. There's Dwayne. Uh, did you open that coconut? Yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> okay, he says he did. He has a big smile proving it, so we'll believe it. Okay, so let's just pause on the bathroom because you, you heard him say that. Um, but I just want to pause. Uh, let's give this one to Matthew, since you were you were uh, you were narrating. So Matthew, talk to me a little bit about this bathroom situation. In as much detail as is appropriate, right now. <laughs> <laughs> we were explained to that the bathrooms uh, worked a lot differently than the ones in America. They had a little saying. They said, "If it's yellow, let it mellow. If it's brown, flush it down." And so, I'm sure you know what that means. And uh, they also said don't flush toilet paper down because the toilets don't have enough suction to get it through. And someone decided that the toilets had enough suction to get a lot of toilet paper through and then they clogged. And so we had to move from one dorm to the next. So you might be asking yourself this question, if you can't put the toilet paper in the toilet, yeah. what do you do with it? I'm feeling like you're asking that question in your head. <laughs> so what you do is there's in every little stall, there's a little tiny trash, ba trash bag, a trash can with a little plastic bag in it. And so you just do what you need to do, and then you fold it or wrap it so that no one else knows what you did, and you leave it right there, and it just gets emptied as trash. So. Uh, enough of that. Yeah, so on to the food. So this is where we ate every day. Nice segue, right? So you, <laughs> there's no segue from that. There's no good segue from that. So I just put food next. 
Okay, so we had an area, yes, we had an area, a large area, like I said, there were about 90 of us, and every day, different groups had part of kitchen duty, because who would like to cook three meals a day for 90 people? Look, the only ones who raise their hands are the kids, because they don't know any Oh, this one right here. Okay, I need your name and address. I'm going to need your name and address for this kid's over. her. Um, so it's a hard job to cook for 90 people. Next, please. So, next, please. So here's Jeremy and uh, Jordan and um, Sam. Jordan and Sam. They had kitchen duty one day. This is actually them washing dishes. So it's kind of rough, you know. Yeah, there's no big. There is a. There was a uh, a sink, but this was something big. So they had to um, wash dishes. Jordan had to put glasses on to cut onions because you can imagine for 90 people, it's not just one or two onions that need to be cut. It's a lot. Of, whatever needs to be cut is a whole, whole, a whole lot of it. Next, please. <laughs> okay, so construction. Somebody said construction wasn't that hard. I'm not sure about that. Next, please. So when we showed up, okay, let me just give you a scope of the construction, a scope of the work. So there were two construction sites. One construction site, this one, was building a church from the ground up. The other construction site, very odd, a little elder in the church had little by little built the walls to the church, but it still had a dirt floor. So the other group poured the concrete floor. I just want to tell you there was not a cement mixing truck in sight. So yeah, they poured the concrete floor. Jeremy, what's happening here? Uh, on the first day when we got there, we had to put up the frame. Um, for where the roofing would go. So these are, these are called trestles, and we nailed them together, and then um, we put them on top of the beam, on top of the side beams going up. Next, please. Yeah, just hit that real quick. You, you don't have to play it. I just want to let you see the picture. Okay, you can stop that right there. Just pause that. Okay, so this is the church on the first Sabbath. We started work on Friday. So the first day, they got the tresses up, and then they just put a piece of something on top so that we were able to worship. Next. Dwayne. <laughs> what is this? And what did you have to do? Well, this is the actual side wall. Um, this is where we lay block, not to be confused with brick. Because every time I say brick, they're like, nah, this is block we're laying over here. <laughs> And this is um, rewire, which reinforces the wall, which every um, four levels of block we had to reinforce it with cement to surround it. So um, this was actually the hardest part of the whole gig here. I mean, the trust, you know, it's a little work screwing in, you know, screws and everything, but putting these blocks, we stacking them 11 stories or 11 um, blocks high, then the, you know, the columns of the building is the hardest part. So this is where all the sweat went in. Okay, now you, he mentioned the rebar that's going up, and if you see there, you can see that the block is going through the rebar, which means that when you lay a block right there, you have to pick it up over the rebar to, yes, to gently put it down, because now when you pick it up, it has, it has mud mortar on it, so yeah, not, not, an easy, not an easy task. Just another picture of the wall going up. Okay, so this is kind of close to the last day, and you can see all the uh, all the blocks are up, and it's just the very top that needs to be that needs to be taken care of. Um, does anybody know what that screen might be for? Any any Destin, do you know do you know the screen? Yes. Sir. Well, the screen was for when we had to make. We had to make and mix the gravel together to make the cement. We had to uh, like shake through all the all the um, things that we couldn't use to mix together to actually make the wall. And so we didn't have anything to mix it with our actual like cement mix. So we just used that screen to um, <clears throat> to clean to clean out the to clean out the rocks and gravel so we could actually mix it together. Great, thank you. Okay, more construction. More construction. Okay, painting, Arceo. Next picture and then we can talk about painting. Okay, 
So with painting, the way that that worked is the church had already been built. There was a roof on it, and there was a, a concrete floor, and the walls were all up. Um, now it just needed to be painted. So we we showed up, and then we just started painting the walls. But the problem with that is that the paint, the guys who would go and work, get our paint when we ran out, they would water it down so much. I mean, like, there was, it was, I think the guy told me it was half and half, so there was half of the whole bucket was water. And so you would put that paint on and it would just run right off. Like, it was so frustrating because we had, in the end, we had to put like four coats of paint over the whole building. We painted the building like four times because the paint and the color would just, it wouldn't stay on there. So the top, we painted a kind of whitish color, but, oh, and we had to prime it first, so. That was also there too. And then we had to paint, we painted the bottom part of it brown. Um, and then the metal bars and the doors red. Um, oh no, we ended up painting those brown in the end, right? Yeah. Uh, we actually finished this, the church and then there was a school next to it. And the guy who runs the school, he saw us painting and he was like, hey, you want to paint my school too? So well, we went over there and we ended up painting the school as well. So that was an unplanned thing that through the grace of God ended up happening. Next, please. Another thing that happened is this is the very front of the church, and they came to us and said, we need, a, we need a gate, we need a fence, we need something. And so, next, please. Um, in the end, we were able to, right on the spot, raise some extra money to do that block work right out front, and then you can see the brown that he's talking about. So that's it, probably on the Friday before we were able to worship in there on Sabbath. The other, one of the other things that we did was Vacation Bible School. So every morning you have six buses lined up. Two construction sites, Vacation Bible School, Medical, um, that's not six, five buses. And so I'll let uh, Julie tell us about BBS. Well, I'll talk about it a little bit later when I sum things up, but um, I was able to work with different people every single day. We make a team, we plan what was going to happen, and we'd head out and we went to two different spots and uh, one that was that hour away, one that was close. But one lucky thing, if you were on the children's ministry and it was lunchtime, we stopped by the beach and had our lunch on the beach. So everybody who came, they were like, what, we're eating lunch out here at the beach? I just go, shh, don't tell anybody. But at the very end, the director came to me and said, um, you've been eating on the beach? I'm like, mm-hmm. Uh, did, did the bus driver take you there? I said, oh yeah, but I asked him to. Oh, I said, yeah, we, we work and network and plan for the afternoon. He said, oh, okay, that's great then. Okay, thanks. Next, please. Medical. Okay, I'll do medical. You can go to the next slide. So in addition to this, um, people come to do construction work, but there's also always a large contingent of nurses, doctors, and dentists who come on these trips. So if you are a nurse, doctor, or dentist, and you don't necessarily want to do construction work, then we can certainly use your services doing medical clinic. And they go to a place, in this case, this is the same school where we did vacation Bible school, just in a different building. And they go and they set up generally fairly crudely, as you can see, and um, you know, let the people know they're coming. They usually give tickets because it can get kind of dicey sometimes. And then they do medical clinics. People who are not doctors, nurses, lawyers or Indian chiefs do get an opportunity to participate. Um, you saw a picture earlier, there was a little kid, nine-year-old kid doing fluoride treatments. Um, and so different things happen on mission trips that would never happen in regular life. Up in the top left-hand corner, uh, I can't remember those guys' names, um, Jefferson and Giovanni. They, people would come by their station and they would have them read a little excerpt from Steps to Christ. And then, depending upon what size they could read, they would give them glasses based upon that, based upon the strength. So those glasses are all lined up by strength. And they would start with a smaller one and just go up until they were actually able to read. So these guys, I don't know, 9 and 12 years old or 10 and 12, something like that, were actually dispensing glasses uh, for people who were so thrilled to be able to get something to, um, to help them to be able to see and to read. Next, please. Worship. Next, please. So I told you what happened. We were all in different places during the course of the day. So this is uh, Isaiah here just expounding, probably sharing a little of what he shared today. And every day, next please. Every, and that's the leader, Steve. Uh, let's see. Scotty. 
What's happening here? This is a. I guess the uh, upper left hand is probably the. Well, let's go with what day is. I'm guessing this is the first set. Because the. Uh, is it both of them? Okay. Um, we had went on the first Sabbath to the, the uh, church that I've worked construction on and uh, shared message and, and played music and they had asked us to come back the following month. So we uh, we kind of committed to that. But by the end of the week, uh, the crew that stayed there, each crew that stayed with the church they were working on you had personal interest in that church. So you tended to want to go to that church. And uh, that was the fun part about that. And uh, we donated, uh, I think it was on the spot too, we took up money for chairs. Everybody's pretty strapped for money and all that, but amazing between that group of 90 people, we pull out two and five hundred dollars at a time for different, two different times. It's amazing what God can do to a different bunch of different people. And uh, we donated, uh, what was it, 150 or more chairs to the two churches. And like she said, it was a few hundred dollars to get the gate put up and stuff like that. Um, but it was a lot of fun, along with a lot of work. Big Dwayne up there. He was the did he do the preaching at that church? Yes. Yeah, he, he, was, he was a good guy. And there was just a lot of wonderful people that were there. Oh yeah, yeah, big time on that. Yeah, it was very cool to see the people who for whom we were building the church to come out and do whatever they could do to be of to be of assistance. And I'm not gonna do too much on the excursion because you saw a lot on the excursion. So we'll keep going, keep going, keep going. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful party shots, keep going. Uh, so if anybody wants a haircut, you can just plug in right under the stairs and we can get you taken care of immediately. <laughs> Next. This right here is a canyon that we passed on our way to the excursion. This is actually where the Rambo, one of the Rambo films was made, right there in the Dominican Republic. This is an underground cave that we went to one Sabbath, just uh, just a pretty cool thing to do. Uh, streets, you see that truck up on the top left hand side. The photo looks like it's stopped, but actually it's a sugarcane truck and the truck is moving. And when the truck moves, people chase by the truck and grab sugarcane out so that they can uh, later enjoy it. This is what I want to get to before we get to our last part. Thank you for your prayers, encouraging words, support, and donations. Really, we cannot say Thank you enough. And I just want to go through what we did in 10 days. We painted a church in a school, poured concrete stairs, and built a gate. Poured a concrete floor and sidewalks for a church with no cement trucks. Ministered to hundreds of children through children's ministries programs. Built a church from the ground up. Stucco and painting will be done by another Maranatha group to follow. Saw over 600 people in medical clinics, gave away scores of reading glasses. That's a lot in 10 days by 90 people. One of you, I'd love to say One of your reasons, I personally love these things because we would still be having a meeting about getting all that stuff done. But you could just go there and just knock these things out and get stuff done for God. So again, it was my privilege, my pleasure to be able to go, to be able to be with this group. Miss Briggs, where is Miss? Oh, there she is. Yeah, Ms. Briggs was unfortunately not able to join us, but it was all her brainchild. We're up front, but it was really her brainchild. And so we're so grateful and appreciative um, for her and her work and her leadership along with others as well. And I think that will do it for me. You guys may have a seat. And so it's my job to try to kind of bring this all together. And I think the best way for me to do that is just to share uh, my little personal journey uh, that happened as we were putting this together. So I want to start with a quote. Uh, it was written by St. Francis of Assisi. I think most of us are familiar with him. And uh, this quote sums up this Dominican Republic mission trip for me. You see, I really never planned to be on this trip to start with. At the very first meeting last fall, uh, which I attended as a happy parent because our seal uh, interested in going, and so I was there to help support to help him get on the trip. And uh, I expected to give my money to help some other students go. But uh, Loretta, who was there helping to organize it, looked at me and said, are you going? And I said, no, I'm not really planning to. And she said, oh, you're going. And I smiled nicely, at least I, I hope it was a nice smile. But I thought, oh, I don't think so. 
Anyway, the meeting proceeded, and the very best part of this meeting was the story that Loretta shared about God working in her life to take her on many, many mission trips. And uh, her story this time was about how God had um, worked in her life just like George Mueller. She'd been reading about him and learning about him, and so she shared a little bit about him, and I think most of us know he was a great 19th century worker for God, and he was a maverick. Okay? He didn't do things in just the regular way. He would step out and, um, you know, into, with faith and, and try to accomplish things that you would think were impossible. In his biography, he's described as one who devised large and liberal things for the Lord's cause. And one of those things were the many orphanages that he put together, really, by prayer, because otherwise it wouldn't have happened. Well, her personal, personal testimony was so inspiring. And I thought, you know, living close to God like that, wow, giving him a chance to work in one's life, that's really what it's all about. And I said to myself, I wish I could live like that. Oh, and remember I had said I would share the quote. Oh, let me get back to that. This quote is, start by doing what's necessary, then what's possible, and suddenly you're doing the impossible. So I'm going to say that one more time. Start by doing what's necessary, then what's possible, and suddenly you are doing the impossible. So after that first meeting, we realized we had a group of students who really were anxious to go on a mission trip, that we had really about zero dollars, and that we didn't have very much time for fundraising. Now remember, originally I had never planned to be part of this, right? And um, I felt after that first meeting um, some kind of hug. So I prayed about it and I said, God, if you want me to help directly, you see, because I wasn't the teacher, it was Mrs. Briggs who was really in charge. And so I said, if you want me to really be a part of this, then I am going to go to some friends and I'm going to ask for monetary support. And I prayed that it would be uh, and monetary support and also what they thought about the whole thing. And I prayed, I said, if they're very supportive and positive and they say they're going to help with money, and I said I need it to be more than like $50, okay, then I guess I'll, I'll be part of this. So, um, and this friend is from this church, so... I went, and uh, I came away from that meeting really blown away because it ended up being the friend and that person's friend, and they were both very, very positive, and they suggested a donation of several thousand dollars that they thought would not be a problem. So I was like, whoa, okay, guess I'm in this. I found myself what I might call the slippery slope, slope of God's leading. The other members, parents, and teachers of the mission trip committee joined together, and I think we all slipped right into that first part of the quote, start by doing what's necessary. And so we sat down and brainstormed with the students on how we could raise some money. And then we moved into the second part of the quote, do what's possible. And so before we knew it, though, suddenly we're doing the third part, the impossible. At each deadline, we found that we had just enough money to meet that deadline, to make it happen. I remember one time Loretta coming to my classroom and saying, well, I made the payment, and there was $4.11 left in the account. So, now, you know, my plan, even at this point, was still um, to be getting any money I had for the other students to be able to go. But then, Maranatha called, and asked me to be in charge of the children's ministry. And I carefully checked to make sure of what was involved. You know, I said, well, if it's like when we went in Belize, we went over to the elementary school and we shared stories and we sang with them a little bit and played some sports, you know, like that kind of thing I can do. Oh yeah, that'd be great, he said. And uh, so now I knew for sure I was going. 
But as time went on and you talked with me further, I realized I needed to do some real planning. It was going to be a little more involved than just wandering next door to the school. And so I was trying to get a handle on things and get a number of like about how many kids we'd be working with so I'd know what to bring. And every time I asked, nobody could give me an answer. And finally, I said, Loretta, give me a number. She said, well, we don't really know. I said, give me a number. So she said, well, between 18 and 80. Uh, great, thanks. So somehow, in my head, the number 100 was there. And so I just said, well, let me go with that. And so my, uh, my mom and I and some other family members who I was able to corral during spring break, helped me cut 100 whales for the story of Jonah, 200 fish and 1,000 loaves for little lad, and a number of other things that you saw in the photos. And once again, I had started doing what was necessary. Then what was possible, I ended up doing the impossible because of God's leading, just like Loretta had talked about that first meeting. Well, I arrived in Belize. I met Steve, the Maranatha leader. He told me that I'd be going out the next day to find places to hold our children's ministry. And once again, I'm like, wait a minute. This isn't what I bargained for. I didn't know what it meant to go out and find places. I didn't speak Spanish. I didn't have the foggiest idea what to do. And that's all he said. And then he walked away. And so now I was stressing for the rest of the day. And I prayed about it, and I said, really, this is truly impossible for me. But finally, I think that evening or the next morning, he came to me and said, well, I have a translator for you. <sighs> okay. And he said, you'll be going out with a medical team. They're looking for medical sites. And that was kind of a, as well, because I would actually have uh, some direction and help. So anyway, to make a long story short, I'd like to report that the 100 set of crafts were just right. We did two sessions a day, and we had nearly 100 kids between the two sites. So there was virtually nothing left over at the end. So anyway, Loretta, you were right. I did go. And because of your inspirational story, I was able to see God working in my life and others. And today, I challenge each one of you to follow the example of George Mueller, Loretta Spivey, these young people, the other sponsors, and join God and start by doing what's necessary, then what's possible, and suddenly you will be doing what's impossible. So for the last time, if you haven't gotten the theme, we want to say thank you again. You really helped us to do what was absolutely impossible. Just last, um, Julie Smith was also very important in just helping to get fundraising and selling haystacks and selling this and selling that. It just it was such a blessing, and we're just so very grateful. I hope if you don't get anything else, you get that we are so grateful for what you did to help these young people to be able to go. Thank you. Well, thank you for being here today and for joining us. So they were showing that video of the white sand beaches and the palm trees. I was back on the computer at the Maranatha site getting ready to sign up. Then the blocks. <laughs> I canceled that out. Uh, beautiful pictures and video. In 1986, I went to uh, Grand Cayman on a mission trip. And uh, we just have a few grainy photographs. So you're going to treasure those videos when you get old and gray like me to be able to look back and remember the impact you had on that community. Um, I want to just welcome you again. Thank you all for being here today. I see lots of visitors. I'm sure there's some family members here. Uh, we welcome you to come back and join us again next week and the week after that. We're trying to build people here too, and so you'll always be welcome here. If you look around, you see there's, there's room for you here, room for you and your friends. 